Hey everyone, welcome to week 38. This is day four in our empty apartment. Uh, <laughs> this is our ongoing, what can I learn from Rembrandt week. So we did self-portraits, uh, unity and light, uh, commitment, you know, decision-making, looking at his uh, sketches. And for today, we're gonna concentrate on character. So we'll see how we do. Okay, let's get started. This is day four. This is our ongoing What Can I Learn From Rembrandt week. And for the past couple of days, what we've done is sort of dissect three different aspects that are present in Rembrandt's work. And for each day of the week, we've tried to kind of hone in on that aspect. We've tried to focus in on that aspect, on those particular aspects, and try to reflect upon how by identifying them, we can actually put them to use in our own work. And, and this is the most important part of this week. It's not just about reflecting upon this amazing master's work. We do have to identify them. We do have to think about what they did and try to recognize their intent and how they executed that intent. But we also have to acknowledge that the teachings that are available through their work, through their painting, can be in some way, hopefully, applied in our own work. Now, does that mean that every single person can learn something from Rembrandt and more importantly can apply it to their own practice? Probably not. I think we can all learn something for sure, but I'm also certain that some people are going to say, I do accept his genius. I am moved by his work, but while I do recognize those elements that we're speaking about, I think my sensibility lies elsewhere and I think that I am capable of celebrating this amazing human being and I'm able to relish these incredible feats of painting but when I look at my own work it just lies elsewhere and that's totally fine too because sometimes we think that for us to be respectful towards somebody else's work it has to in some way appear in our own work and that is so not true I think the vast majority of the artists that truly truly move me they look nothing like my own painting they look absolutely dissimilar to what I do. And the reason I think that I'm attracted so much to painting that has nothing to do with my work is the fact that in their work, I find something that I am not. Whenever they do things, I realize how much broader the expanse of painting is. My vision is indeed limited. And I'm always grateful when I realize that there is this bigger universe lying outside my very narrow field of vision. Every time I look at something that is far from what I do and yet I am moved by it, it feels like my universe, like my known universe of painting is just expanding. That's why I'm so eager and I'm so curious to look and find, you know, other people's work because to contemplate the possibility of finding somebody's work that can broaden our understanding of painting is just a fascinating idea to me. But as with life itself, I think that this is sort of like a inhaling, exhaling exercise. When we exhale, this universe of painting just expands. But when we inhale, we go back to our roots. And I think my roots are Rembrandt. I, I, I really do feel that this is going to be a constant in my life. You know what's curious about Rembrandt? I am in a path where I am completely void of feeling anything towards my paintings. Anything in the sense that... It, I don't feel they're precious. I don't want to hold on to them. I feel they are completely ephemeral acts. And I don't feel like they belong to me. I don't feel like they belong to time. I'm really grateful that I've had this opportunity, not only throughout this year with this project, but for the last couple of years while I was doing a very specific sketchbook project too, that I started realizing that I could pour my heart and soul onto paintings and then just turn the page, do it again and turn the page and do it again. And in that act of turning the page and doing another painting, the previous painting lost all meaning as an object. What I gained from it, the teachings that it left behind, the experience, that I kept. 
that obviously I could turn, you know, a thousand pages and I would never lose those thousand experiences. But the object itself was slowly losing importance for me. Nowadays, I could tell you, and I'm being very honest with myself when I say this, I am not beholden to the object of painting. I sometimes envision a world where there is no painting. I, I've talked about this before, and it's a sort of kind of crazy fantasy that I have where we would have to re-signify painting and try to understand what lies at the core of painting. But we would have to do that without having any visual aids or any traces of previous paintings. And I think that would be a fascinating kind of conceptual exercise to try and understand the idea of painting without having any visual stimulus. And every time I think that that is just this fascinating idea where we hold on to the very abstract sense of painting, to this need to paint, to this instinctual need to paint, and we would try to define this practice in some way, and we would try to understand how this practice is tied to our humanity. Every time I'm willing to say goodbye to all of the history of painting in order to resignify it in the future, I think of Rembrandt. And I think, I don't think I can do it. Even though this is a fantasy that, that I have, that I hope it doesn't sound like dystopic in any sense. This is not about painting history burning down to a crisp and happily seeing, you know, all these ashes. No, this is not destructive in a sense. This is just trying to kind of weed out all the trash that has clinged on to painting throughout hundreds of years. All the stuff that's exogenous to the nature of painting that actually distorts our perception of it. And my hope is that we could really recognize what it means to us as a species and not just as, you know, making a painting so we can sell it eventually for a hundred million dollars or whatever stupid price tag you could put, you know, in front of a painting. So that's an actual fantasy that I always, always have. It's like this recurrent idea of mine. But when I think of Rembrandt, and when I think of having to give up Rembrandt and to say, I will never see a Rembrandt again, because that would be egoistic on my part. More importantly, the fact that newer generations of painters would never be able to experience who Rembrandt was, who Rembrandt was through his paintings. So I am denying myself the possibility of seeing these paintings again. But that blow is lessened because I've already seen a bunch of Rembrandts in my life. And I can hold on to the idea that I've formed in my brain of what a Rembrandt is. But how would I explain to other people the insane genius that Rembrandt was without having those paintings, without experiencing those paintings? And that's the moment where my dream, this strange fantasy, this very almost dark fantasy just falls apart because I don't think I would be able to sacrifice that. It's kind of sad because I know that I'm in a path where I am not attached at all to the physical side of painting. I'm obviously speaking about my own painting, but, but when I think of the painters that have shaped me and obviously Rembrandt is one of the painters that I owe almost everything in my life. I'm still grabbing onto those branches. You know, I, I, I think that I can be very strong willed when it comes to my own work. But when I think of work of extraordinary people, and perhaps this is the difference, because when I see my own work, I just see painting, just regular painting. It is whatever is left behind from somebody who works like really hard. That's how I define myself. I just think I'm a normal human being that has worked hard. But when I think of Rembrandt, you know, that's an extraordinary human being. I mean, billions of people will be in this planet and Rembrandt is always going to be extraordinary. He's always going to be somebody who was different in the history of our species. Whenever I think I have to sacrifice the physical accompaniment of the idea of him, that is his paintings and his etchings and his drawings, I'm like, no, this is too precious. You know, I, I wish, I wish I didn't have this idea of things being too precious. But whenever I think of Rembrandt, I'm like, no, I can't do it you know it's too important and one of the reasons I do feel that there's um, connection that I have with him this bond it's almost like I'm, I'm tied I'm chained to his work really 
and I'm unable to imagine a world without those paintings is because this aspect that we're working on today is just so close to me and that is character. And I think Rembrandt is one of those fascinating human beings that was able to portray what is at the core of our emotions. He was an incredible draftsperson. He obviously had this insane formal ability, but for some reason, there's this quirky kind of fanciful side of him that goes beyond just uh, feeling empathy for his own subject matter. It almost feels like he can tap into whatever it seems to be the makeup of the people or the places that he was representing, that he was interpreting through painting. And that's very, very difficult. I say this when I talk about extraordinary human beings like uh, Camille Claudel or like Olga Boznanska, where I feel that they were able to grab onto something ethereal and understand it, and so much so that they were able to shape it into sculpture or into painting. And I think Rembrandt is one of those people that he understood how to recognize the essence of the people that he was looking at. Now, I have no idea for a fact, you know, what those people look like. You know, we were talking about this on Monday. I can't say that he was faithful to those people. But I think that instinctually, I create this connection between myself and his work only because I sense that there is a human being present behind his paintings, that the essence of humanity is there. And like we've always said, how do you learn that? You don't. How do you teach that? You don't. You don't. I don't know. I don't even know if you're born with this or if it's a perception that has to be shaped through experiences. I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't think you can get better at it. I think the only way you can kind of come to terms and respect that ability that you have to look into other people is just by answering to oneself. And that's why I think that this is not about ego. This is not about us feeling that we are right in this equation that the painter always knows best. No, this is not about that. I, again, I feel that when we are honest with the act of painting, it is one of the most humbling acts that we'll ever encounter in our life. So there's no room for egos there. What I'm referring to when I say that we have to be honest with ourselves, that we have to answer to ourselves, is the fact that we have to understand that maybe at times there is this deep connection that is telling us that painting is not about getting everything right. So much of our education, especially if we are into very formal education, and, and there's a lot of painting still that is based and, and has a foundation on a very classical idea of what painting and drawing is. So much of that education is about being faithful to nature, but faithful in a very almost narrow-minded way where we have to constantly check ourselves. We have to check with nature constantly. So if we make a measurement and we're about to do a second measurement, we have to look at nature and see how those relationships are established in nature. And we have to transcribe those same relationships to our image. That act of, of just checking and going back to our source and checking and checking and checking everything, it can be a, an act that almost devours us. And in that repetition, in that ritual of constantly checking our painting, and this doesn't have to do with just a very abstract notion of drawing where we check our measurements, where we check our angles. We can also check our values. We can also literally check our color. This act where we are constantly conscious of the need to translate that reality in a very faithful manner can be an act that ends up sort of devouring our own voice. If we get caught up in this, again, ritual, in this repetition of measuring and checking, measuring and checking, measuring and checking, then our voice, our perception kind of gets lost and distorted. And we start believing that the only goal that we should have while painting or drawing is to be right. Because if we are right, then we're getting closer to that quote unquote real idea of nature. And if we understand nature as being perfect, then the closer we are to those relationships, you know, the more beautiful our painting can be. But here's the thing. A wonderful thing happens when we say, no, I respect nature. I cherish nature. I celebrate nature. I celebrate the person that is in front of me. But I'm also going to try and give myself into my own perception and my own empathy 
and the empathy that I have for my fellow human being that's right in front of me. And I'm going to say, it is not about seeing myself in you. It is about recognizing our sense of humanity in you. And this is the biggest oof that we've done because how do you do that? I mean, how does one go about doing that? How does one say, I'm going to try to recognize the essence of you and then I'm going to push that essence, you know, because one thing is recognizing it and then we have to actually reshape it and, and turn it into a painting. And in that reconfiguring act is where we can say, I'm going to push this and this and I find this really exciting and this moment moves me the most. And that's where we establish these new hierarchies that answer to who we are and how we perceive things. So this is a terribly complex equation if you really think about it. But what are those variables? You know, how do we identify them? We, we don't. And I think character is one of those things that gets kind of lost because the, the, the whole idea is terribly abstract. And we can understand a more exaggerated version of character that we call caricature. We can actually understand and rationalize a caricature. It's like, oh yeah, you know, he has a big nose, so I'm going to make that nose even bigger. When we see Daumier's uh, sculptures, they are some of the most beautiful examples of caricature in the history of art. And we recognize that. We recognize like those sort of archetypes that are part of our species. But when we want to be a little more subtle about it, when we want to sprinkle some of that character into that very formal discipline training that we've all had, you know, what does that look like? Like, how does that work? How does one reach a natural balance? I don't know. I don't know. I really don't. I think that that's one of the hardest things that, at least for me, I've ever contemplated because I don't know. I don't know. The one thing that I do is I give in. I give in to those things. You know, I see them as very playful things. I see them as opportunities to just do stuff that I'm not really used to. And many times I push and many times I swing and miss, but I always give myself the chance. I always kind of grant myself the chance because I know myself and I know that there is such a degree of discipline that is inherent to the act of painting that I don't want that to drown my voice. I don't want that to ever, ever drown the very instinctual manner in which I am moved by something. I would always favor answering to something moving me than to feeling that my role as an artist is just to be disciplined about it and to say, okay, I'm having those feelings, but I can't give in to those feelings. You know, I have to just measure even more. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that artist because I know I'm not. Other people can be those artists and I can celebrate, you know, when they do amazing works of art, but that's not what I do. So how do we define character? Ah, I really don't know. I really don't. I just, I just feel you have to have empathy, connection. Um, you have to understand who you're looking at as, as somebody who is a kindred soul, who shares something that goes beyond our superficiality. No, there's something, you know, a lot deeper. There's like millions and millions of years of evolution that are there in us that make us connect with each other as a species. And I don't know, how do you tap into instinct? It's almost like you're not supposed to, you know, if it's instinct, it's not supposed to be something that you think about. <laughs> so this is a very tough aspect to try and rationalize. But when we do it through a simple act of painting, there are tons of things that we can learn from it. And for me, it's just about respecting it. It's just about saying, I am going to answer to this. I'm going to celebrate this. And by answering to this, I'm going to feel that I'm not afraid of it. And I'm going to build upon it and construct eventually what is going to be my voice. So, so that was it for today. Character. Again, biggest oof ever. So, <laughs> but I'm really happy with uh, today's painting. I think Siebe is, is a wonderful, wonderful model. I was very, very happy to have the chance to paint him and think about, you know, these incredible qualities that I see in Rembrandt. So I couldn't have ever asked for just a, a cooler, more talented young artist to do this exercise with. So Siebe, you're awesome. <laughs> Lots of love, dude. That was it for today. Uh, join us tomorrow where we're going to do our last day and it's going to be like an all-encompassing day 
Uh, tomorrow I'm going to do a painting of Danny. She powered through this week, so I, I just want to look at her and I want her to look at me back. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but that's tomorrow, end of the week. So I'll see you guys later. Thank you. Bye.